Open your Bibles, please, to Malachi, the last Old Testament book before Matthew. And what we have here, what I want to speak about, is cleaning house, house cleaning, cleaning house. And boy, is the Lord big on cleaning his house. That'll happen. That's the judgment seat of Christ. So Malachi chapter 3 uh, talks about John the Baptist. There's a prophecy in verse 1 about the messenger. Behold, I send my messenger. That's John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Well, he did physically show up. And there's three places in Scripture where he cleanses the temple, where he barges in there and uh, does a work on them. His own people, by the way. There were no Gentiles there. It was his own people. He didn't hold back. Took a, a whip of cords in his hand and, wow. Christians say, oh, brother, pray for us. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I said, that's true. Amen. Thank God for that. He really does. And by the way, did you ever think you might need a beating? What? <laughs> I says, why do you always think all your needs, is, it can only be positive? It says, you know, you need this, you need that. We need a lot of things. But what we really need, God will supply. But sometimes you need a beating. Sometimes you need persecution. Sometimes you need to be slandered. Sometimes you need to go through a rough ordeal and shake a little bit, okay? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. These are needs in some cases. God help you. It says, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He did, even the messenger of the covenant. That's the Lord whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But now watch verse 2. Here's the judgment seat of Christ. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire. Think of a blacksmith. And like fuller's soap. That's a whitening agent, fuller's soap. I had a hard time in biblical days getting garments white. They use fuller soap. Verse 3. And he shall sit as a refiner. Oh man, if that isn't the judgment seat of Christ. And purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. That's you. We're the priests unto God. We're a royal priesthood. Levi was the priestly tribe. The descendants of Levi managed the temple. We are that. We are they. <laughs> We're sons of Levi, spiritually. And purge them as gold and silver. Well, by the way, that process has been happening since you got saved. How far along it is, I don't know. You might know. The Lord knows for sure, but I don't know. And some of you, I guess if you were to, you know, be honest, you'd say, well, it hasn't gone very far in my life, and I'm ashamed. It says, that means you get the judgment seat of Christ is going to be where the process is completed. Catholics think it's purgatory. See, they, they see the word purge. Ah, purgatory. No, it's the judgment seat of Christ. And purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. You see, after we're purged, then we're presented as the bride of Christ. We are now espoused to Christ. We're his fiance, and boy, he's in love with us, man. I sometimes wonder how can God love a people like us, but He does, and He's going to wash us clean with full of soap spiritually, and He's going to refine us like a heavenly blacksmith and get all the garbage and impurities that got to be taken out, and then dress us in white and we'll be presented as the Lamb's bride. Oh, man. But he's got to do this, you see. He's got to do this. Now, you'll understand it better if you turn to what is this. This is the uh, 2 Corinthians 7 1. I, I remember debating, well, not debating is not the right word, but tr instructing a Christian who wasn't taught well, although he was a Christian a long time. He was talking about, you know, the Spirit of God being in us. I said, Amen. Christ that dwelleth in you. It's a mystery. It, it, and it's a wonderful thing to know that the Lord in, indwells you. I said, but you know, the Lord is living in a place that's filthy. He said, what? So when the Lord comes in, he, he cleans you. He, he can't occupy a filthy area. I says, brother, you don't know the scriptures too well. 
I says, turn to 2 Corinthians and look at chapter 7 and look at verse 1 very carefully. So whenever a Christian tells you, well, no, I, I, I can't be uh, possessed by demons. Well, maybe not possessed, depending upon how far you want to take that word. I know Christians that have killed people, okay? Killed people, yeah, committed murder. Now, can you be oppressed? Certainly, absolutely, in many ways, shapes and forms, to the point where you might, uh, want, and I know Christians that have killed themselves, including a, a pastor and an evangelist. Okay, yeah, you could be oppressed of the devil to the point that you don't want to be around anymore, and you do the, in my opinion, the most selfish act you can commit, which is to take your life. And where does that leave loved ones and people that you knew, whatever? You don't care about them or what the morning and they get, they'll go through the grief. No, you don't care about any of that. You just want out, and the way you want out is to end your life. And then, as a Christian, you're saved. Then you present yourself to God and say, "Here I am." <laughs> Well before your time. Boy, what a mess that's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. And there's a number of Christians that have gone that far, believe it or not. And why? Well, there's things in them that never really seem to get cleaned out. Look at this verse. Uh, the Lord lives in your spirit. He indwells your spirit. Yes. Could, could you have a filthy spirit? Well, the scripture can't lie. Look at the verse 1. Having therefore these promises, and he's telling the Corinthians, and they're a carnal church. They're not the cleanest bunch, if you know what I mean. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Us. How? By, through the word of God. Let us cleanse ourselves. You have the power. God told you you had the power. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I dealt with addicts so many times, telling them, why do you keep doing this? Well, pray for me, brother. I'm trying. I'm trying my foot. That what you're telling me, listen, I'm from Brooklyn. I've been around the block. When you start saying this baloney, I'm trying, what you're really saying is I haven't made up my mind to, click, to quit it yet because I like it. Okay? Don't give me this garbage. I try and try and try and you want everybody's sympathy. Do it. Do it. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Do it. I don't care if you lock yourself up in a room and put bandages over your mouth or on your arms, put a cast there or whatever. Well, whatever you have to do, do it. It says, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all, what? Filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Uh-oh, this Christian looked at that. I showed him the verse. I said, listen, you're sincere, you love God, but you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know the scriptures. Why? you got to cleanse yourself, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And that's the thing that's missing today, more than anything else. I'm not, I'm not giving you sound doctrine. I'm not harping on sound doctrine. Most Baptists have it down pretty good, and 90% of all the King James Bible believers have it down pretty good. I'm talking about holiness, which is what's slipping away, slipping away, and slipping away in these last days. Holiness, the fact that God is holy. We conveniently forget that. So he wants us to cleanse ourselves. Now, what is this spiritual filth that's in us? People say, what does that mean? Bro, pride, maybe. Envy. Thinking who you are. Arrogancy. God knows what's in your spirit. You know, this uh, rashness, uh, temper, ready to explode all the time. Uh, bitterness, carrying grudges. Oh, he did this to me and he said that. Who cares? What did they do to the Lord? Why does the Bible say looking unto him? Because if you look to him and you see what he endured, you'll shut up. What are you going to endure here in America as a Christian? Be told don't stand on this corner or preach or go home or get a job or... Well, really? Who's, take, who's jailing you and putting you in jail for reading your Bible or giving out a tract or whatever? Perfecting holiness, that's the thing, holiness. Now, I got a note here, and I got to see why I looked that up. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Sometimes I put these things down. Oh, well, John eleven forty four. when Lazarus came out, uh, the Lord told the people around him, remove the grave clothes. Okay, brothers and sisters, there it is. He came out in grave clothes, and the Lord told the people, remove them. Why? He said, well, he's a new creature. Get rid of the old stinking smelly garments. Okay, burn them. Burn them. Don't, don't put them in the washing machine. Try and 
recondition him, just burn him. I got another thing here, Second Chronicles twenty nine sixteen. Let me let me go forward and see why Second Chronicles twenty nine sixteen. Why did I mark that? It has to do with this verse. For sure I wouldn't have marked it. Oh here it is. Second Chronicles twenty nine sixteen. And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, that's your spirit. Remember, there's three parts. There's the outer court, there's the holy, and then there's the holy of holies, the inner place where the uh, Ark of the Covenant is. And only the high priest can go in there one, one day a year, which is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So you got to look at this. And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord. Are you the house of the Lord? Does Christ live in you? Yeah, amen. Where? In the inner part. Okay, what does it say? To cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. They brought it outside. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad unto the brook Kidron. That's the cleansing. That's what years ago people called revival. People getting right, people cleansing, real revival. You know, you don't have that today. It's, it's ridiculous revival. Come to a, we're having a revival meeting. Oh, please. I hope somebody gets revived and gets right. I never forget this Pentecostal guy in Brooklyn. He said, hey, there's a big revival going out in Long Island. They had opened up some mega church or whatever. I said, really? He says, yeah. I said, is it a biblical revival? He said, well, it's a revival. I said, is it biblical? So what do you mean? I says, in the Bible, revivals meant, you know, real action, real forsaking of sin, real changes that you couldn't deny were happening to people or had, had happened to people. I says, with this big revival supposedly going out in certain areas in Long Island, has uh, any bars and grills closed down? Has anybody uh, sold a liquor store and got into another business? Any cat houses shut down that you know of? Bordellos? He's looking at me. Anybody burning their filthy book collection? <laughs> I, I says, you, when you talk about real revival, bibli I mean biblical revival, not this stuff that passes for revival today and people get happy for a while and go right back to the same old baloney. And they make this, like New Year's uh, pledges on New Year's Eve. You know, they, they play, I'm going to quit this, I'm going to do that. And, do you know January is the best month for health spas and diet uh, programs? They do great in January. But then, and then there's a noticeable fall off in February and March. And by the time April comes along, where is everybody? <laughs> They're at uh, McDonald's. <laughs> I get a kick out of this. People mean well. You sound like, oh, Brother Mill tell you, mocking people. No, they, they're sincere. But that doesn't get the job done, brothers and sisters. There's more to action. Uh, more uh, it needs to happen, not just good wishes and good intentions. Daniel, his, his friends, purposed in their heart not to defile themselves with the king's meat. They didn't make any of these silly promises, uh, I'm going to stick to this diet for the next three months. No, they made up their mind, what? We're eating kosher. We're eating the food God wants us to have, and we're not touching the king's food. And when all is said and done, we'll be healthier and look better than those that are eating the king's food. And they were right. So promises, make all the promises you want. I just showed you the verse you need to look at again and again and again. Put it down. 2 Corinthians Chapter 7, verse 1. You got some cleaning to do in the inner part of the temple. Know what I mean, Jelly Bean? Dr. Ruckman used to always say that. Amen? Amen.